Welcome back to the next episode of the Every Wars Russia series. In the last episode, we followed the story of Moscow and how they developed from a small Russian principality to being among the most powerful states in Eastern Europe and the definitive great power of the Eastern Slavs. This episode kicks off with Ivan IV, who had named himself the Tsar of Russia, thereby ending the era of Muscovy and starting the era of the Russian Tsardom. What crazy wars did the Russian Tsars get up to in this time frame? To start off with a bang, we have the final war between Russia and Kazan. This would be the war that would finally see the Russians fully annex the region, kicking off Russia's conquest of the steppes. Immediately after, we have the Tatar Rebellion, where the remnants of Kazan, supported by the Nogai Horde, would attempt to restore the Kazan Khanate. They would fail, and after four years of fighting, the rebellion would be crushed. Over in the north, we have Ivan the Terrible's Swedish War. It was a relatively inconsequential war, which came about from tensions between the two sides, as Ivan didn't see Sweden as equal to Russia, therefore forcing Swedish ambassadors to deal with the governor of Novgorod instead of Ivan himself, remarking, Novgorod's governors are descendant from sovereign rulers of great empires, whereas your parents sold oxen at a market several decades ago. Ouch. Still, little actually happened during the war and it would end in a white peace. To the south, the once great Golden Horde now no longer exists. The new horde, the Astrakhan Khanate, would be quickly attacked by the Russians and so, for the first time ever, Russia would reach the Caspian Sea and Russia's position in the south would be greatly bolstered. But back north, Ivan's quips did little to save him from the wrath of the Swedes. Russia would engage in combat with Sweden and Denmark over Baltic territories, initially achieving some military successes. Things would change, however, when Poland-Lithuania got involved. The new coalition would manage to push back and defeat the Russians. In the peace deal, Poland-Lithuania gained much of the Baltic and removed some lands from Russia, while Sweden and Denmark divided up Estonia and Sweden took Ingria, devastating Russian ambitions in the Black Sea. A catastrophic defeat for the Russians. But in the steppes, the Russians would achieve more success. In the first true clash between future rivals, Russia and the Ottomans went to war, as the Ottomans hoped to support Crimea in a reconquest of Astrakhan. A Russian counteroffensive would force the Ottomans back, and 70% of the Turkish army passed away from freezing. A random storm in the Black Sea would also destroy the entire Ottoman navy in the region. An embarrassing defeat for the Turks. But, not to be deterred, the Ottomans immediately planned a new invasion. A force of 100,000 Ottoman and Crimean troops led an invasion of Russia. In what would become a staple of Russian military strategy, they would retreat further and further inland. The Crimeans would manage to burn Moscow down, but following that, Russia would manage to destroy the Tatar armies completely. This war is often seen as the final moment where the Tatars seriously threatened Russian independence, or at least control over the southern steppes. We then have several very small-scale conflicts regarding the Russian conquest of Siberia as Russia crossed the Urals. These have been oversimplified as a single war, with the thing that truly kicked off Russian colonization being the conquest of the Khanate of Sibir. From this conquest onwards, Russian explorers, soldiers, Cossacks and merchants slowly took control over all of Siberia over the course of the next two centuries. Then we have Boris Godunov's Swedish War, Boris Godunov being the regent of Russia. This war is commonly regarded as a draw, where Russia regained control over Ingria, but had to accept Swedish control over Estonia. In Finland, the two parties also discussed where exactly their border lay. Then, the devastating Polish-Muscovite War. Tsar Theodor I had passed away childless in 1598, causing the times of trouble in Russia, a terrible time for Russia, which included a succession crisis and the end of the ruling Rurik dynasty. Poland hoped to exploit this weakness by supporting pretenders to the Russian throne, hoping to install a puppet Tsar. Sweden initially fought the Poles as well, but later switched sides to fight the Russians instead, starting the parallel Ingrian War, where the Swedes too hoped to place a Swedish duke on the Russian throne. Let's discuss the Ingrian War first. The Swedes failed to conquer Russia, but they had many successes regardless, and in the peace deal would once again seize Ingria, denying Russian access to the Baltic Sea for the next century. Back over to Poland, 
the Poles would manage to occupy Moscow, but would fail to retain permanent control over the city, nor establish a Polish puppet Tsar on the Russian throne. With the ascendancy of Michael Romanov, the first of the Romanov dynasty of Russian Tsars, the war would end. Still, despite Polish failures to subdue Russia fully, the Poles would still achieve significant land gains. During these conflicts, Ivan Bolotnikov would launch a revolution against the Tsar, hoping to remove the nation's elites. He would be crushed. The following Smolensk War would see Russia attempt to reconquer lost territories, most importantly, the city of Smolensk, but as the main Russian force was defeated, the war was concluded. Which leads us to the very first Russo-Persian War, also known as Alexis I's Persian War. It was a minor conflict where the Safavids destroyed some Russian forts in disputed lands before both the Shah and the Tsar agreed to end the conflict, a minor Russian defeat. Another faraway conflict for Moscow sees it engage in its very first confrontation with China, as Russia's explorers go further and further east. The main conflict was about Russian expansion into Manchuria, north of the Amur River, which was unacceptable to the Chinese. Unsurprisingly, China managed to destroy the Russian forts, and Russia would sign the Treaty of Nerchinsk, recognizing Chinese control over all of outer Manchuria. Back in Europe, a massive battle for Eastern Europe is about to begin. A group of Cossacks have revolted against Polish rule, aligning themselves to Russians. The Russians would make massive successes against the Poles. To make matters worse, Sweden also joined the invasion in what would become known as the Deluge, where about a third of the Commonwealth's population would be lost. The very independence of Poland came under threat, but the intervention of Prussia and the Habsburgs on the side of the Poles, as well as Russian intervention against the Swedes, would lead to Sweden slowly backing off. From here, the war goes back to being a one-on-one -on -one between Poland and Russia, eventually leading to Russia annexing a significant chunk of territory from Poland. From this moment forwards, due to Polish population and territorial losses, Poland essentially stopped being an Eastern European superpower. In terms of naming, the Russian war against Sweden counts as the second Northern War, while the larger war against Poland counts as the first Northern War. The war against Sweden saw Russia seize some minor territories, but then giving them back three years later, as Russia was too busy kicking Poland's ass to risk war with Sweden again. Internally, the Bashkirs rebelled against Russia for taking away their feudal rights. Militarily, Russia could have just suppressed the rebellion, but because they were busy fighting Poland, they chose to negotiate with them instead, ending the rebellion. Stefan Razin was not as successful, as he would lead a Cossack uprising against the government, temporarily turning Astrakhan into a Cossack Republic, hoping to expand this new republic further along the Volga. His armies would be routed and defeated. Next are a series of wars against the Turks, with the first one being Fyodor III's Turkish War, revolving around conflicting claims on territory in southern Ukraine. The war would end inconclusively, with both sides accepting the Dniepro as the border for now. Because only two years later, Russia would go to war with the Turks again, this time in a major alliance with Poland and Austria. This league was headed by Austria, and it was the very first time that Christian states pushed back significantly against the Ottomans, as the Habsburgs conquered most of Hungary in this war. Russia, meanwhile, seized full control over the very important Azov region on the Black Sea, setting up for Russia's future Black Sea ambitions. Over in the Urals, the Bashmirs would again revolt against Russian rule. Militarily, the Russians were successful in crushing the worst of the revolt, but to fully end it, the Russians had to give some concessions to the revolters. In the Don region, another Cossack rebellion would attempt to gain autonomy from Moscow's central rule. The rebellion would be crushed. Peter the Great's Kievan War would see a Russian commander attempt to conquer the Kievan Khanate, this state all the way down here. Interestingly, he actually achieved some military success, but was then tricked into meeting with the Kievan Khan, who pretended to surrender. The Russian commander would be ambushed and killed. Peter decided not to avenge this loss, since as you'll soon see, he was busy elsewhere. This Kievan war would however be the first of the Kazakh-Russian conflict, where over a period of about a century, the Russians would slowly consolidate control over what is now Kazakhstan. But to conclude the video with a banger of a war, we have the third installment of the Northern Wars, and like all trilogies, it's the best. 
The main war would see Sweden fight the Poles, pushing so far that both Warsaw and Krakow, the two biggest cities, fell into Swedish hands. This would lead to Russia intervening against the Swedes to prevent Swedish hegemony in Eastern Europe. Despite this, the Swedes would continue to win great victories until the main Swedish army was caught behind enemy lines, defeated and the puppet regime that Sweden set up in Poland fully collapsed. This would lead to the Danes jumping in on the fun as well as just about everybody became set to destroy Sweden. Slowly but steadily, the Swedes would be pushed back by the coalition until the Swedes just couldn't hold on any longer. The peace deal would see Sweden stop being a great power, losing some territory to Prussia, but more importantly, losing control over Ingrian and Finnish lands, as well as the entire Baltics, with everything going to Russia. This war would cement Russia as the dominant Eastern European power, with both Poland and Sweden defeated. As a side note, to the south, the Ottomans had started a parallel war, and while they wouldn't make massive victories, the Russians did have to cede Azov back to the Ottomans. Would Peter the Great let this slide on his Black Sea ambitions go? We will have to find out next episode, as after winning the Northern War, Peter the Great would announce the creation of the Russian Empire, separating itself from the Tsardom that came before. As a new regime, it will get its own video next week. So, how successful was the Russian Tsardom in wars? It won 48% of the wars they participated in, lost 30%, and wars ended inconclusively the other 19% of the time. Turning this into scores, with 3 points for victory, 1 point for draws, and 0 for losses, the Russian Tsardom gets placed at the bottom of our list so far, behind its predecessor, Muscovy. Now as we all know, the Russian Empire is famed for its terrible military. So, join me next week as we explore the wars of the Russian Empire and its placement on our tier list. But that's where I'll end this video. Thank you all for watching, consider leaving a like and a comment to support the content, and subscribe for two more videos every single week. To continue watching, click on one of the two videos on screen now. Again, thank you all for watching, and goodbye.